Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Chronicler Podcast channel. Episode 16, The Rise of Chin. Hello there, and welcome back to the Chronicler Podcast once again. But before I get started with today's episode, I just want to say, I started this Chronicler Podcast in part because China's history goes relatively unnoticed, or even completely forgotten around the world. If you're interested in learning more forgotten history, my friend Michael Buster hosts a podcast called Forgotten Wars, a show that focuses on wars that have impacted millions, but have been forgotten by billions. The first season focuses on the Boer Wars, and on the ripple effects that European settlements had in South Africa. Next week, instead of hearing my boring old voice, you'll get to hear a pilot episode from the Forgotten Wars podcast. Even now, you can search for the Forgotten Wars podcast almost anywhere you listen to podcasts. But for now, on with today's episode, which is the rise of Chin. The state of Chin were on the western periphery of the Warren states at the time, and their rise to prominence was down to multiple factors, and, I guess, a little bit of luck. But the main focus I want to go into today are 1. Chen's geographical position 2. Seeking talent 3. The reforms of Minister Xiang Yang, which we've already kind of touched on a bit and 4. The little bit of luck I mentioned, which was the incompetence of the other states of the time. So I thought I'd better start with the state of Qin's geographical position. Like I mentioned earlier, Qin was in the western zone of the Warren States Territory and could easily defend itself from invasions from most sides. Why could it defend itself so well, you may ask? Well, if you look at a physical map of China, then figure out where the Qin were, you would be able to see why. To the south you had massive mountain ranges, and to the west it was mostly desert. The north was mostly plains which were cons- uh, sorry, occupied by Xiongnu people, a semi-nomadic confederation, which we will get to later, as they play a role in the rise of Qin as well. And finally, to the east, there was only one narrow pass that you could get access to through the states, like through this pass, you could only, this is the only way you could get in from the east to the west. The narrow pass had mountains to the south and it had the Yellow River to the north. So basically, it was a perfect place to ambush an army that might come by and try to attack you. The centre of Qin power was also the city of Xiangyang, which would later be called Chang'an, and its modern day name is Xi'an. If you ever visit China, I highly recommend seeing Xi'an. The city is beautiful, the food is awesome, and not to mention, the terracotta warriors are there too. What more could you ask for? But back to the historical stuff. The strategic location of Xi'an is important because of this pass. There is a reason why future dynasties like the Qin, for example, and then the Han and the Tang later on, all established their capitals there. That is a solid layer of protection from Mother Nature before any army could come across the city walls. Now that's the military side of the location, but what about the land they held? It's fine and well to hold on to land that's easily defendable, but it's not really worth it if it's a wasteland, right? What's the point? But it was actually the contrary for the state of Qin. The land in the interior was rather fertile. Agricultural yields were high, and there was plenty of iron in the region, which allowed the state to produce more weapons more quickly than the other states, and therefore given Qin armies an edge over their enemies. Now speaking of armies, I mentioned the Xiongnu to the north, the semi-nomadic-like peoples. Remember at the end of the Western Zhou Dynasty podcast episode, there was that unbelievably stupid emperor who kept lighting the fire beacons even though there was no army? (laughs) Yeah, well, 
it was an attack from the Xiongnu that got ignored. As the Zhou royal family were fleeing from Chang'an towards Liliang, they left the Ying family to protect them as they fled east. And as a result, the city of Chang'an was given to the Ying family. And therefore, that's where the Dukes uh, came from and that's where the state of Qing came from. So the Ying family, they looked over this land for generation after generation after generation. And they first started off as dukes, loyal to the Zhou, who then became one of the big players in the Warren States and called themselves kings. And then, of course, you finally get to the end where you have emperors such as Qin Shi Huang. But we'll get to that later on. But back to the military stuff. So the state of Qin were supposed to defend the realm from these barbarians, as they were referred to. And by being in close proximity to the Xiongnu, the eastern states regarded Qin as semi-barbarians themselves. I mean, talk about snobbery. But I mean, it wasn't as if the Xiongnu had that one attack, sacked Chang'an, and then left to never return. The Qin had to defend their borders from attacks a lot. And this did two things. The first thing it did was that it gave the Qin army more experience than their enemies, as they had to fight wars on two fronts pretty much. And the second thing is that they had to build a wall, which would later be connected to the other state's walls, and then you would have the Great Wall. But I will leave it there for location. But just remember, if you need to defend a state and you need to fight a battle, location Location, location. It's important. The second point I mentioned was seeking talent. And I must admit, this kind of blends in nicely with my third point, which is Xiangyang. So what I will do is go over some other famous people or capable ministers who joined the Qin court, then moved on. Qin didn't only search within their own borders for talented ministers but far and wide across the realm to find capable men to do the job. People literally flogged from other states into the protective boundaries of Qin to serve the dukes, which would later be kings, who would later be emperors. Talented men such as Han Feizi, Xin Yang and Li Su didn't actually come from the state of Qin, but elsewhere. Han Feizi from Han, Li Su from Chu and last but not least, Xiang Yan from Wei. Now you'd be thinking that this isn't exactly a radical idea, right? But actually, back then it was. This was the golden age of feudalism in China, and that meant positions in government were inherited. I mean, getting a job because you're good at it? Who's this crazy guy? That crazy guy, my friend, would be Shang Yan, by the way. But this idea allowed Qin to create a strong, stable central government which enforced its laws as harsh as they were, which brings me on to the laws themselves, the laws that Xiang Yang enforced. And this is which brings me on to my third point, which is, like I've just said, it's Xiang Yang. Now, I've already mentioned Xiang Yang in the episode in regards to legalism, but I did tend to kind of skim over pretty much his life and then didn't really get into his reforms and the effects of said reforms. So I will do it here. Xiang Yan basically abolished the feudalistic ideas that were present not only in Qin, but every other state of the time. And what is really surprising is that his, I guess you could call it, patron, Duke Xiao, allowed him to do this. Duke Xiao was so impressed with Xiang Yan that he allowed him to steamroll over his entire court. Although, I could see why. The more people that were removed who inherited their position rather than earned it, the more power the Duke had to himself. So basically, you could say that Xiang Yang really centralised the power of the state. But, how did he do this? Well, it was actually quite clever, I must admit. I would never have thought of it. But this guy did. That's probably why he's been remembered throughout the ages, and I will likely not be. So what he did was make everyone, and I mean everyone, subject to the law. If you were caught breaking the law, 
Regardless of your position, you would be punished in consideration with the law that you just broke. So theft, for example, would be losing your hands, your nose and your tongue. Shang Yang did create a police state where there was an extremely harsh system of reward and punishment, which everyone was subject to, including the Duke's own son. And boy, did the Duke's own son get it. Unfortunately, pissing off the failure Duke of the Kingdom wasn't the smartest of ideas, which we will soon see. But to suffice to say, Shang Yang convinced Duke Xiao to punish his own son for some trivial crime. Well, the rewards which I'm going to get into, were actually pretty great as well. So, I mean, on one side you've got basically somebody hitting a donkey with a stick, but on the other side, they're dangling the carrot. So what was the carrot? The carrot was literally a carrot because the reforms that he put forward were agrarian ones. And I will let Mark Edward Lewis explain it in his great read, The Early Chinese Empires. And I quote here, Qin's ultimate military and political success was due to the agrarian reforms instituted by Shang Yang. From 350 BC onward, the Qin government legally recognised ownership of land by peasant households, along with the right to buy and sell it. At the same time, families from overpopulated states into the east were encouraged to resettle in the sparsely populated Qin. In exchange for their recognition of land ownership, peasants were obliged to pay taxes and provide service, especially military service, to the state. Qin's heartland in the Wei River Valley was gridded by pathways and irrigation ditches into uniform plots that could be given away as rewards or inducements for loyalty to the central government. This transformation of the structure of Qin's agricultural lands and the relation of its people to that structure underlay the state's rise to power." End quote. So to sum up what Mark was saying here, it basically meant that through allowing peasants to own and sell land, it guaranteed power for the central state. Qin Dukes could literally raise armies themselves and wouldn't need to go through any of the nobility to raise those armies. That was a big deal. It ensured the loyalty to the central regime, and it ensured that, if the time came, Qin could call on armies quickly. And not to mention the extra plots of land, which could be used for rewards upon completing great military deeds, or in other words, killing as many enemy soldiers as possible. All of a sudden, the army seemed like a decent place to go for a career and fame, as there were no obstacles to being promoted based on the number of enemy heads you brought back to camp. In other words, feudalism was completely wiped out in Qin and played a huge role in their success in conquering the other warring states. Now, we mentioned how Shang Yang annoyed Duke Xiao's son. Well, he got his comeuppance pretty much as soon as the old man died and his son took over. He immediately set out for Shang Yang's arrest and then executed him by ripping him apart with four chariots. Nasty business. But the funny thing is, did the son, who would later be called King Hui Wen, remove the reforms? Well, actually no. And why should he? He did hold complete authority within the state after all, <coughs> thanks to Shang Yang. And I would like to think that, you know, the lines from the movies that you always see, they, would kind of, they always kind of go like, oh sorry, it's only business, nothing personal. Whereas King Hui Wen, would have said the opposite. So he would have said, Sorry, Shang Yang, it's only personal, not business. So that's Shang Yang's reforms being touched on a little bit in more depth. And now it's time to move on to my fourth and final point the incompetence of the other states. Now, the other states were too busy squabbling for short term gains and were constantly fighting each other whilst ignoring the Qin juggernaut that was assembling right on their doorsteps. Even when Qin invaded the kingdoms of Shu and Ba in modern Sichuan province, which will be covered in the next episode by the way, the other states should have had alarm bells ringing. But what did they think? 
Some barbarians have invaded other barbarians. Huh, big deal. Fatal error. Considering the Sichuan Basin was able to easily supply massive armies. Further to this, the state of Chu, which were roughly the same size as Chun, squandered opportunities to work with other states in order to deal with the Chun threat. They could have been leaders in an alliance to fight the Chun, and they probably would have won. But the truth is, the kings of Chu, especially the one when Chin Shi Wang launches his conquests, uh, he was hopeless. He was just, nah, like, basically, he was easily convinced, so one diplomat would come and say, please be the leader of this alliance against the Chin, and he'd be, oh yeah, okay, I'll do it. And then another Chin diplomat would come along and say, yeah, you should stay out of the war. And then he'd go, oh, okay. So yeah, he was kind of an idiot. Um, basically. And yeah, as a result, one by one, all of the other states would fall to Qin. And then, of course, you would have Qin Shi Huang, who would later become the emperor, the first emperor of China, and then... That's pretty much it. So then we move away from the Zhou, the Spring and Autumn, the Warren States, and we finally get to the times of dynasties. But, like I said, this is going to be saved for next week's episode, which is basically what we're going to do is we're going to look at the conquests of Qin themselves. So, which states fell first? How did they fall? The famous battles. And then we'll probably look at the way of life in Qin, so what Qin Shi Huang does when he becomes emperor, when he finally proclaims that he is Qin Shi Huang, he is the Yellow Emperor, he has uh, unified the entire realm. So what does he do once he's kind of done that? Because I'll, give, I'll tell you something, he doesn't just lie around in a palace and drink his days away. He definitely doesn't do that. And Qin Shi Huang's actually quite a controversial character because well you'll soon see but like I'll give a brief overview because on one side he's seen as this extremely cruel ruler and he was a cruel ruler but at the same time he creates this unified China and for the first time you hear people calling themselves Chinese rather than like from the different states because this is something I want to point out um, if you were to get in a time machine and go back to this time period, and you were, let's say, in the state of Qi. You would never, like, nobody back then would never say, yeah, I'm Chinese. They would say that they are Qi people. And if it was the say you went to the state of Chu, they would say they're Chu people. You never had this idea of unification. So when Qin Shi Huang becomes emperor, this become, like, this is when you have a sense of Chinese identity. Like I said at the beginning of this podcast, next week I'm going to be uploading my good friend Michael's Forgotten War podcast, and then the following week we'll be looking at the conquests of Qin Shi Huang, followed by the reforms that Qin Shi Huang put in place. So, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I look forward to seeing you next time on the Chronicler Podcast channel. Thanks for listening.